My wife and I are doctors of physical therapy and fellow ADG enthusiasts. We really like to nerd out on this stuff, striving for a greater pursuit of truth. Our continual goal is this. Can we further confirm the already proven results on the HG system in the scientific literature? Are the results backed by science or is it all just coincidence? What does the science say? I went ahead and asked Google what it thinks the top 10 knee issues are. These are the top five. Fractures, dislocations, ACL injuries, meniscus injuries, and patellar tendonitis. For each of these issues, I will one, give definitions, and two, give solutions. Of those solutions, either in the acute stage, meaning this just happened to you and you need to figure out what route to go by, either non-surgical or surgical solutions, or B, the chronic state, meaning post-rehab stage. You've been cleared to exercise and you need routes of progressive overload to ensure you get back to reaching your goals. I'll give my favorite exercise progression for each issue, but know that there's a plethora of factors to consider for successful progression from rehab to resilience. None of this is medical advice. Please consult with your medical team to determine what's the best route of action to take for you. Why don't you go ahead and start? So we're going to lump number one and number two together. Fractures or dislocations. So what is a fracture? It's when one section of our bony skeleton experiences such magnitude of force, either internally or externally, that it breaks apart. This can happen with or without a dislocation. It's an area where the two bones that make up the joint separate and possibly bump into each other. You can have a ton of different types of fractures. I'll just overlay some so you can pause the video to see if any of these apply to you. Funny story. Well, it's not really funny, but it is true. My sophomore year of track and field, I had one teammate that was so tight in his hips and in his quads that when he was running a 200 meter repeat, the muscle pulled a piece of bone from his pelvis. This is called an avulsion fracture. Wicked stuff, but you can go ahead and continue. In terms of solutions, it depends on the extent and location of the fracture, whether or not it can heal on its own. For medical professionals, factors considered are whether or not the bone gets misaligned, pokes through the skin, or is concomitant other joint damage. But that's sort of all you can really do though. Let it heal and follow the advice from your, your medical team. Don't want to delay the healing process by loading the bones too soon. But afterwards, for prevention, pulling this from an article from Sports Health, to optimize bone health, adequate nutrition, appropriate weight-bearing exercise, strength training, and adequate calcium and vitamin D are necessary throughout life. So I can't fix your fracture, but when healed, if you need help with improving bone health with those weight-bearing exercises and strength training, I can assist with that. Shoot me a comment below if that indeed applies to you. So fractures, dislocations, number three are ACL injuries. What is the ACL? Anterior cruciate ligament. Anterior is from a Latin word ante, which means before, and that's in reference to the front side of the body. Cruciate is from a Latin word crux, which is in reference to the shape of the ligament, which is in a cross shape. Ligament is from a Latin word legare, which is a verb meaning to bind, which is exactly what this ligament does, bind bone to bone. The ACL binds the lower leg with the upper leg it's in a cross shape, and it's in the front side of the body. Let's get consider the acute stage, meaning this just happened to you and you need to determine a route. There's two primary research studies I like to consider in regards to the ACL, both of which are from Phil Bay et al, one using exercise and one using the cross brace protocol. Let's consider the one using exercise. This was a study of young, previously active individuals aged 18 to 35 years old with a complete ACL rupture within the previous four weeks of the study. They were all randomized to either rehab and optional delayed ACL reconstruction or just going right into ACL reconstruction. The non-surgical group went through a rehab program for 12 12 weeks and then they were re-MRI'd at the end of the 12 weeks at one year at two years and five years respectively to evaluate for MRI healing. Depending on the time of voluntary crossover, ACL healing occurred in 33 to 50% of the participants. In the study, there are three different groups examined for effect. First was the non-surgical group, which led to ACL healing. Second was the non-surgical group and the ACL didn't heal. And third was the surgical group. For every measurement, all groups started at an F minus grade. And I'm just going to B-roll all the average grades at two year follow-up. In conclusion, for this cohort of young, previously active individuals with just 12 weeks of exercise out of the 100 in four weeks possible that they could have exercised if they got the ligament to heal knee noise is less knee pain is less knee confidence is greater and knee function is greater at two year follow-up than those of a reconstructed ligament but the key is getting the ligament to heal so that brings me to the other article by phil bayatel on the cross brace protocol this was a cohort of 80 participants aged 10 to 58 years of age and here's a quote from the findings of the study Lindsay, you can go ahead and read that quote while i set things up after management with the cross bracing protocol cbp 72 out of 80 or 90 percent of participants with complete discontinuity of the acl had signs of acl healing or acl continuity 
on three month MRI. Another interesting statistic in this cohort for the cross bracing protocol, re-injury rates are actually 6% less than the average re-injury rates for the ACL reconstruction. So you can absolutely yield healing in the ACL without surgery, either with exercise or with the cross bracing protocol. If you're interested in this cross bracing protocol where they immobilize your knee into flexion to assist with healing potential of that ligament, contact Global Specialist Physio. He has helped numerous individuals in this route. So how do we progressively overload the ACL when you've been cleared to exercise? Cyclic tension at shallow knee angles activates living cells in the ACL to create bigger and stronger ligament over time. Using less muscles than a double legged squat and less calf and glute than a flat footed step down. This shifts all of the forces onto the connective tissue of the knee. Progress with more height and weight and regress with less height, even assistance as you need. Number four, meniscus injuries. What is the meniscus? The Greek word meniskos, which stands for crescent, which came from a Greek root, mene, which stands for moon. This is a moon-shaped crescent structure between the two bones that make up the knee joint, helping to absorb shock and create stability. For degenerative tears, meaning tears that occur over time and not from a direct event like a twist or a pivot, consider this data from a recent review. 10 studies were evaluated of 1,411 patients showing exercise had surpassing benefits for pain and function compared to surgery. The past three months, both had equal benefits in pain and function. For acute tears, meaning tears occurring immediately from a direct event like a twist or a pivot, consider this data from a recent randomized controlled trial. Regardless of the tear, whether it's a horizontal, radial, bucket handle, there is no difference in pain, function, quality of life at 12 months between the surgical group or the group that did 12 weeks of exercise. The only area where surgery had a surpassing benefit was in alleviating mechanical symptoms like catching, locking, and an inability to straighten the knee. Enter the ATG split squat. Why? Cyclic compression at deep knee angles improves synovial fluid saturation all around the knee joint, helping to nourish any damaged structures in that joint, which include the meniscus. The meniscus has two thirds of its tissue, the inner portion that needs direct nourishment from this fluid. The less you stimulate deep knee bend, the less the body thinks you need this nourishment to these inner structures. And thus, the more these tissues will atrophy, meaning get smaller and shrink and have less strength. Conversely, research shows that gradual inputs of compression can increase metabolism to the meniscus to prevent disuse atrophy. Whether or not the meniscus can literally grow isn't as clear cut. As of now, we cannot say it definitively can, but we can say that you can improve its metabolism and the circulation of its nourishing synovial fluid with deep knee bend progression from elevated resistance, flat ground with loading that you can tolerate without pain. All right, fractures, dislocations, ACL, meniscus. Now we're on to the patellar tendon, specifically patellar tendonitis. What is the patellar tendon? Patellar comes from a Latin word patella, which means a small pan or dish in reference to the shape of the patellar bone of the knee joint. And tendon comes from a Greek word tenon, which means sinew, something that holds the muscle and bone together with a Greek root tenion, meaning to stretch. In order to translate muscular action into real life action, the muscles contractions must pull with enough force that the tendon stretches slightly and then recoils to propel the joint into motion. The more force you get, the greater tendon pull and thus the greater athletic output. And over time, the tendon will adapt to become stronger, i.e. stiffer, meaning it takes more force by the muscle to get it to recoil and the recoils will get more intense over months and years of training. Now, tendonitis occurs when there's an overuse in the tendon side of things. High and fast actions like you find in your sport or when running, jumping, loads the patellar tendon. There's not a ton of data comparing either surgery or exercise for patellar tendonitis, but what I did find is that non-surgical routes and surgical routes are both found to elicit over 90% return to sport rates based on a systematic review of 11 studies, 454 participants over a 30 year span from 1991 to 2021. You're not doomed here. Also, recent high quality evidence shows that out of all the conservative measures, exercise therapy is the most effective method. Progressive overload to the tendon is key. So, how do we progressively overload the patellar tendon when cleared to exercise? The pulpit step wins out again in this category because research shows that with a decline step down at angles greater than 50 degrees but less than 60 degrees, patellar tendon forces increase by 40% compared to flat levels. Now, does this have higher patellar tendon forces than a plyometric jump? Nope, but we see that this is a direct regression from a jump, making it a great benchmark to use to determine safety for reintroduction of jumping activities. Progressively overloading this exercise until you can get back onto jumping without pain. 
causing your tendon cells to improve their size, stiffness, and blood flow over time. I am much more concerned about the tempo of loading for patellar tendonitis. Doing isometric training using my body weight for progressive tendon loading principles. Isometric loading for longer durations helps to unsheath the damaged tendon cells, allowing the body to cause adaptation to those cells to make them healthy again. Then dynamic loading relative to what you can tolerate without pain. So let's consider doing this exercise three times per week for three sets at a time and what that progression might look like. I'll verbally say this first phase and just overlay phases two through five. Phase one might be a three second eccentric, one, two, three, a 30 second isometric, and then a three second concentric, one, two, three. Let's just doing week one, which will be two inches in elevation. I'm doing week two, which will be four inches in elevation. And then finally progress to six inches in elevation, all on a two inch heel wedge. Then we have phase two, week four, week five, week six. Then we have phase three, week seven, week eight, week nine. Then we have phase four, week 10, week 11, week 12. Then we have phase five, week 13, week 14, week 15. So you get the point and only progressing to the next phase when you can perform those three sets three times per week with no increase in pain. Until you can perform a three, 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 zero loading scheme. Three seconds down, down one, two, three. Three second pause, one, two, three, and three second concentric on a six inch box with two inch heel wedge, 50% body weight for 20 reps, feeling like butter before going crazy on the plyometrics. But by no means fearing the return to plyometrics, we have a special routine we like for reintroducing patellar tendon loading with the ATG plyo workout. Shoot me a DM and I'll explain what that progression looks like over the long haul. Fractures, dislocations, ACL injuries, meniscus injuries, and patellar tendonitis. If you've dealt with any of these issues and have been cleared to exercise, please let me know. I'm a coach on staff with the most affordable training program that there is, $49.50 a month for the ATG training program with a discount code making the first month less than $25. No contracts whatsoever. I'm here to ensure you make progress, either without surgery or post-surgery. It doesn't matter. We've helped people decrease pain and improve function from either side of the coin with common sense solutions according to science. Feel free to comment below or shoot me a DM on Instagram if you have any questions. Here's our greater pursuit of truth.